Solar Report, August 2021, from August the 13th. So far this month, we've had calm solar conditions. And at present, we have one sunspot active on the solar disk. The sunspot number is at 11, which means that we currently have one sunspot area containing one sunspot. The case of P planetary index is at 1, while the A index shows 6. The solar flux index, or SFI, is at the low value of 73. At this time, we are not detecting any solar flares or coronal mass ejections on the solar disk. Note that CMEs, leaving the sun, the sun arrive at Earth in 1 to 3 days, while solar flares get to Earth in 8 minutes. That's because solar flares consist of massless particles called photons, which travel at the speed of light while CMEs are actually made up of material particles, ions and other particles, and travel much slower than light. The deep study and understanding of CMEs and solar flares is relatively recent. CMEs were discovered in 1971. However, reports dating back to 1722 and throughout the 1800s record that, quote, Compass needles would change direction by a small angle and remain this way for up to several days. The German naturalist Humboldt in 1836 even called for the creation of a global network of magnetometers to detect these sporadic effects that affected navigation in both land and sea. Now we know that these compass anomalies were likely due to CMEs. Solar flares had also been noted throughout history but the major flare occurrence of the Carrington event of 1859 was indeed a milestone in the scientific literature. Additional flares continued to be recorded, and in 1942, quote-unquote, radio effects caused by solar flares were detected by British radio operators. Due to wartime secrecy, the reports were not made public until after the end of World War II in 1945. These solar effects eventually impact our atmosphere and change its characteristics. As mentioned, the energizing of Earth's atmosphere, its ionosphere, happens from 8 minutes to 3 days after the Sun emits its radiation. The ionosphere is the region that we radio amateurs associate with bouncing off HF signals, and it is located above the tallest mountain, Mount Everest, and above our highest flying airplanes. However, the ionosphere is located below the orbit of lower satellites. The ionosphere was theorized by the German mathematician Gauss in 1839, but it was the experimentalist Guglielmo Marconi from Italy who in 1901 successfully received the first transatlantic radio signal. That transmission originated in Cornwall, England and was received in Newfoundland, Canada. Marconi and his team clearly demonstrated radio communications beyond quote-unquote line of sight. A year after this experimental breakthrough, theory followed with the work of English physicist and electrical engineer Oliver Heaviside and Arthur Kennelly of Ireland and the US, who in 1902 predicted the existence of the heaviside kennelly layer, or the E-layer, which had reflected Marconi's signals. Heaviside went further and speculated that this global layer could be used for worldwide radio communications, an observation indeed ahead of its time. For radio amateurs, the bouncing of HF signals off the ionosphere is the reason why we can make long distance and DX contacts. The density of electrons in the different layers of the ionosphere allow for refraction of the radio waves to take place, effectively bending them back down to Earth. It is interesting to note that once the radio waves hit the ground, they may bounce yet again repeatedly, letting us make radio contacts with the other side of the world. Finally, for our long-distance contacts, we all know that the frequency of radio waves is important. However, we should always remember that the angle of elevation of the transmitting antenna is also of critical importance. This is why antennas with low elevation angles, for example, from 5 to 8 degrees, will typically yield as long as propagation distances when conditions are good. Good luck, good contacts, and 7-3.